Now, given the evolution of media technology, the question arises over how this very same technology relates to war and violent conflict. What, in other words, is the relationship between media and war? How has war been mediated? And how has the recent rise of digital new media technology impacted on the relationship between media and violent conflict? Throughout history, violent conflict has always been mediatized. Poems, sculptures, paintings, books, theater plays, newspapers, photographs, radio, television, satellites, cinema, mobile phones, and most recently, digital new media platforms, all have depicted and mediatized war. This mediatization has therefore influenced how we have viewed and approached violent conflict. Media in that sense has always played an important role in shaping violent events and our understanding thereof. Given the long and intricate relationship between media and war, Recent claims over the transformative, even revolutionary nature of today's digital new media and its impact on violent conflict should make us pause. Has violence from antiquity to the more recent media coverage of the global war on terror and the Arab Spring not always been subject to degrees of editorial choices, propaganda or censorship? How can one plausibly claim that there is anything qualitatively new or even revolutionary about the nature of digital new media today, let alone its relationship with violent conflict. What I would like to argue is that today's emergence of digital new media technology constitutes a sea change. The rise of this new media technology has resulted in a structural shift from a multipolar to a heteropolar global media landscape, in which newly empowered non-state actors and even individuals contest state-controlled war narratives and coverage. Heteropolarity, therefore, refers to the multiplication and simultaneous diversification of structurally different media actors. This current transformation of the global media landscape has in turn impacted heavily on and altered the traditional relationship between media and war, creating the conditions for contemporary media wars. Now that sounds awfully abstract and complicated. So let's unpack this step by step. Let's start off with terms like multipolarity and heteropolarity. What do they mean? To find out, I've been talking to Dr. Parag Khanna. For many years, Prague has been one of the leading researchers on the changing power dynamics occurring in world politics, and in particular on how networks and technologies of connectivity are transforming our world order. So Prague, what do we mean when we talk about multipolarity or a multipolar system? In international relations, a multipolar system is one in which there are multiple states, sovereign states, that are the leading superpowers or great powers in the system. And we tend to think of them as either being all empires, as they were in the colonial era and the imperial era, but since the 19th century in international relations, we're talking about states. So a multipolar order is one in which there are multiple states that are the dominant powers in the system. We're all familiar with the Cold War, in which there were two states that were the dominant poles of power in the system, the United States and the Soviet Union. After the Soviet Union collapsed, we tend to describe the world as unipolar, meaning only one pole, and that was the United States. The big question of the 21st century is, as the world becomes multipolar again, what will be those poles of power? Which states will they be besides the United States? Could Russia be resurgent as a pole of power? China will certainly be one, most people believe, India, Brazil, and others. So we're surely going to be in a multipolar system again of these powerful states in the 21st century. Now, 
for a long time you've been arguing that in fact multipolarity is out that is no longer sufficiently enabling us to explain the nature of the international system and instead you have introduced us to the idea of heteropolarity so what does heteropolarity or heteropolar global system mean and how does it differ from a multiple multipolar one Heteropolarity is very important to understand the complexity of the 21st century. It's true that the world is becoming multipolar. The international system has multiple great powers and superpowers, the United States, China, Russia, India, and so forth. But the global system is much more than just the states that make up the multipolar order. Today, we have to think about a heteropolar world in which there are autonomous actors that are not states, They're very powerful companies, like multinational companies that have global influence, that are almost stateless in their reach. Then there's non-state actors, whether it's terrorist groups or non-governmental organizations and civil society groups. There's the media as well, which is often also stateless and independent. Think of WikiLeaks or Anonymous and so forth. And because all of these actors are autonomous from each other, They influence each other in very complicated ways. States influence the non-state groups, and non-state groups influence the states. And so the system is not just multipolar, it's heteropolar at the same time. And I guess you could also make the argument here that on a very fundamental level, what has really changed in that move from a multipolar to a heteropolar system is that the number of actors has increased significantly but also that the way or the nature of these different actors is inherently unlike what it is that we used to have with states in the past absolutely i find that with heteropolarity over time we are seeing a greater diversity and a greater number of different actors that are populating the world stage and having growing influence let's take the example of companies About 25 or 30 years ago, there were very few companies that were truly stateless in their reach. Just a few companies that were commodities traders were able to negotiate on equal terms and have leverage over governments to access their resources and use the markets to move them around the world. Today, there are dozens of such com companies, if not hundreds. Technology companies are able to manipulate tax structures and government policies around the world to be located in multiple places at the same time. No one government can control them. The same is true of many financial services players, actors like hedge funds, for example. The more and more private global companies there are, the more you see heteropolarity at work when it comes to the corporate private sector. The same is true in the world of violent or militarily uh, powerful non-governmental actors like terrorist groups. It's not just Al-Qaeda or ISIS. It can be branches of the Syrian rebel groups, for example, that are operating today um, across uh, the Middle East and North Africa. So then there's also non-governmental civic organizations, groups like the Gates Foundation, for example, or the Clinton Initiative. They have convening power. They have a lot of money that they're able to spend. They shape development policy and aid policy of actual governments both internationally and the host governments where they are operating on their own. So across these different verticals of the heteropolar order, companies, civil society, militant groups, and states, we see a great, great diversity and a growing number of intersecting and interacting players. Okay, so now that we have a sense of what terms such as multipolarity and heteropolarity actually mean, How and in what ways can we use them to make sense of the type of developments we see within the media sphere, within the transformations in the global media landscape? And how does all of this relate to questions over war and violent conflict? Analyzing the media is actually a very interesting proxy for the transformation towards a heteropolar world. When I was a child growing up in the 1980s in the United States, there were exactly three television stations to choose from for our news. It was CBS, NBC, and ABC. Then came CNN as the first cable news network in the United States, which really launched in the early 1990s when Iraq invaded Kuwait. Throughout the 1990s is exactly the time that the world wide web 
began to expand. So we saw the rise of social media and online news websites like Yahoo, for example, and Google was born in the mid-1990s. Now, if you fast forward today, we have the overlapping and in conflicting sometimes media verticals or entities that come from radio, from television, from satellite TV, from the internet, social media, and then of course those that cut across them and conglomerates that operate across all of these spheres at the same time. Then you have those that are state-owned and those that are private, those that are national and those that are international. So this complexity of heteropolarity is mirrored very much by looking at just how complex and multi-layered and multi-domain the media itself has become. And of course, now we see that they do play an ever more prominent role in war, in peace, in conflict, in stability. Because news travels so fast, communication is so instantaneous, that shaping the narrative space, shaping the narrative battlefield, is something that anyone can do if they are able to reach out to an audience. Twitter, Facebook, uh, fake news, WikiLeaks, anonymous, um, state-based groups that will manipulate foreign media or social media in which any individual can spread information, true or false, from on the ground or from afar. Talking to Prague Kana, we get a sense of a world in flux, of a world undergoing profound changes. Networks and technologies of connectivity are transforming our global order and are changing the power dynamics in world politics. What structurally used to be a multipolar system has been replaced by a heteropolar one. 